50 years sealed in steel. They finally open the Apollo 17 sample. The lead NASA scientist is stunned. He says, very different from anything we find on Earth. Sulfur isotopes that do not belong. The timing, just as Artemis gears up to send astronauts back. Why wait until now? Why this sample, this anomaly, this warning, right before humans return to the moon? What follows is not what you have heard. They opened a sealed Apollo sample after 50 years. The result was a bombshell. The core arrived at Johnson Space Center in December 1972, sealed twice, once on the moon, once again on Earth. Inside, a sliver of lunar history waited, untouched for 50 years. When the time finally came, the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Team treated it like a new mission. Custom tools, cold glove boxes, every move scripted to keep the sample pure. James Dottin, a planetary geochemist at Brown University, led the sulfur analysis. His team used a secondary ion mass spectrometer, an instrument with precision Apollo scientists could only dream of. They targeted troilite grains, tiny flecks of iron sulfide locked in volcanic rock since the moon's early days. The first measurements came in. Dottin expected sulfur 33 readings that matched Earth's mantle. That is what every textbook and every prior lunar sample had suggested. Instead, the numbers fell off the chart. Sulfur 33 was depleted, by a margin no one had ever recorded in lunar material. Delta 33 S values dropped to minus 2.8 per mil, far outside the range for terrestrial rocks. Dotin checked the calibration, ran the standards again, repeated the analysis. Same result. The anomaly would not go away. Dotin told reporters, Before this, it was thought that the lunar mantle had the same sulfur isotope composition as Earth. That's what I expected to see. But instead, we saw values that are very different from anything we find on Earth. The finding was published in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets in 2025. Peer-reviewed, double-checked, now part of the official record. No one could dismiss it as a glitch or contamination. For decades, oxygen isotopes between Earth and Moon matched almost perfectly, a cornerstone of the giant impact theory. If the Moon and Earth formed from the same cataclysm, their chemical DNA should match. This sulfur result broke that symmetry. Two explanations surfaced. One. The Moon once had a thin atmosphere, long enough for ultraviolet light to alter surface sulfur-33, and that altered material somehow became buried and mixed into the deep mantle. 2. The signature is not lunar at all, but a surviving piece of Theia, the Mars-sized impactor that built the Moon. If the second is true, the Moon is a geological archive of a destroyed planet. Either way, the textbooks are wrong. The Moon's interior is not a simple echo of Earth. It is something far stranger. Dottin's team was not alone in its shock. The anomaly forced lunar scientists to reconsider early volcanism, mantle processes, and the very model of how the Moon formed. The core kept its secret for 50 years. When it finally spoke, it changed the rules. They waited 50 years to open one of the most pristine Apollo cores, the official story sounded reasonable. Preserve a few untouched samples until technology finally caught up. But the timing raises questions. For decades, isotope mass spectrometers could have detected the same sulfur signature found in sample 73001. The tools were not the problem. So why wait until now, just as Artemis is gearing up to send humans back to unseal that core? NASA's Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Program, ANGSA, was pitched as a way to treat unopened Apollo samples like a brand new return mission without the cost or risk of flying to the moon. The program's stated mission was to extract every clue, every volatile molecule, and every isotope from these frozen time capsules. But the language quickly shifted. ANGSA according to NASA's own documents, would also prepare the lunar sample community for Artemis. Not just about pure science, about readiness, about risk.
Thomas Zerbuchen put it this way, We finally get to see what treasures are held within. He called them treasures, not relics, not leftovers. As if the real value was always locked away, waiting for the right moment or the right pressure to open them. The program did not just spring up out of nowhere. A NGSA's first major funding push landed as Artemis mission planning moved into high gear. Suddenly, the unopened cores, sealed since Nixon was in office, became urgent priorities. NASA rolled out custom tools, cold cabinets, international science teams. The process was meticulous, but the sense of timing was hard to ignore. The agency could have cracked these cores open in the 1980s, the 2000s, or any time advanced instruments became available. Instead, the green light came only when political will and budget aligned with the push to put boots back on the moon. The official line was simple. Modern secondary ion mass spectrometry instruments, nanoscale imaging, and gas capture rigs offered a leap in sensitivity. True, the resolution is better now. But the core question lingers. Was the science really so different in 2019 than in 2009? Or was there another reason to hold back until Artemis was on the launch pad? For a program designed to probe the unknown, ANGSA's timing is almost too perfect. The first core opened, the first anomalies published, and the first new risk reports, all within the same window as Artemis contracts, lander designs, and congressional hearings. The pattern is hard to miss. As soon as the moon becomes a destination again, the sealed evidence comes out of storage. And with it, the warnings. Zurbuchen's choice of words, treasures, echoes through every press release and scientific abstract. But in the background, a different message is taking shape. The moon is not just a target for exploration. It is a place with secrets. Secrets that, for half a century, waited for the right moment to be revealed. Oxygen isotopes were always the linchpin. For decades, every new lunar sample reinforced the same message. Earth and Moon, born from the same cosmic wreck, should look like siblings under the microscope. That is what made the Sulphur-33 anomaly so jarring. One element, a perfect match. The next, a glaring outlier. The impact theory, the one in every textbook, depends on near-total mixing. If a Mars-sized world called Thea slammed into Earth and threw up the debris that became the Moon, then everything from the core out should blend. The oxygen data fit that story. But sulfur does not. There is no easy fix. The numbers force two competing scenarios, each rewriting the early history of the Moon. The first is a thin, fleeting lunar atmosphere, Picture the newborn moon, still glowing from the violence of its birth, cloaked in a haze of volcanic gases. Ultraviolet light from the sun hits this atmosphere, breaking chemical bonds, stripping away sulfur-33 in a way that Earth's thick air never allowed. Over time, this altered sulfur rains out, gets buried, and somehow sinks deep into the mantle, despite the moon lacking plate tectonics. Billions of years later, it erupts back to the surface, preserved in volcanic rock, waiting for a mass spectrometer to spot it. This is the photochemical scenario. It means the Moon once had an atmosphere, however thin, however brief, strong enough to leave a permanent chemical scar. The second possibility is even stranger. The anomaly is not lunar at all. It is a relic, a fingerprint from Thea. If the Moon's interior still holds pockets of unmixed material from that lost world, then a core sample happened to punch straight into one. The Sulphur-33 depletion becomes a message from a vanished planet. In this version, the Moon is less a twin of Earth and more a time capsule, half formed from the debris of a cosmic collision still carrying the isotopic DNA of its parent bodies. If true, this would mean the Moon's mantle is a patchwork, some parts echoing Earth, others forever foreign. Neither explanation is easy to swallow. Both demand a new look at how the Moon cooled, erupted, and recycled its own surface. Both challenge the idea that the Moon is just Earth's echo, and both hinge on a single, stubborn measurement 
from a core kept sealed for 50 years. The anomaly is not just a curiosity, it is a crack running straight through the foundation of lunar science. Until more cores are opened, until other samples tell the same story or contradict it, the moon's true origin stays unresolved. The next answer might be locked in a tube, still waiting for its moment. June 2024. A Chinese lander touches down on the far side of the moon in the shadowed depths of the South Pole Aitken Basin. Chang'e 6 scoops up nearly two kilograms of lunar soil and rock, material no human hand has ever touched. From a hemisphere the Apollo missions never reached. The samples arrive on Earth under tight control, flown straight to Beijing, then divided among teams tasked with answering a question that has haunted lunar science for decades. Why does the Moon wear two faces? Orbital surveys had already drawn the outline. The near side, familiar from every photograph, is covered in dark volcanic plains, rich in heat producing elements and dotted with ancient lava flows. The far side is a battered highland, pale and mountainous, with a crust thicker, colder and poorer in the radioactive ingredients that drive volcanic activity. The contrast is so stark, some geologists call it the lunar dichotomy. Preliminary studies from Chinese Academy of Sciences teams point to a mantle source more depleted than anything sampled by Apollo or Chang'e 5. The regolith grains are lighter in potassium, thorium and rare earths, the chemical fingerprints of a world that has been bled dry of its most volatile and fertile elements. Early mineral analyses suggest a crust built from anorthosite, not basalt. A world shaped by ancient impacts and slow cooling, not by seas of lava. Hints about water content are starting to leak out. Far side grains show less official hydrogen than their near side cousins, echoing years of orbital neutron and infrared data. If confirmed, this means the lunar interior is not just patchy, it is parched in some regions, hydrated in others. The Moon's water story is not a single line, but a map of drought and oases written in rock. Then there is the magnetic puzzle. Apollo samples hinted at a lunar dynamo, a core once hot and restless enough to generate a magnetic field, now long dead. New modeling, paired with localized magnetic anomalies mapped from orbit, suggests the field may have flickered back to life billions of years after it was supposed to vanish. If Chang'e 6 rocks preserve a record of that rebound, then the far side was not just cold and quiet. It was a place where the moon's heart briefly stirred again. Dynamo. Two hemispheres. Two histories. The near side, shaped by fire and water. The far side, colder, drier, and more ancient than anyone guessed. The sulfur mystery from Apollo now sits beside a broader paradox. If the moon formed in one cataclysm, how did it split into such different worlds? Every new sample deepens the question. And the next landing site, Artemis, Chang'e, or whoever gets there first, will have to pick a side. Lunar dust isn't just a nuisance, it's a biological threat that NASA still cannot fully control. Rosemary Killen, a scientist at NASA Goddard, does not mince words. She calls the dust loaded, not just with sharp edges, but with electrostatic charge and chemical reactivity. When astronauts walk, drive or drill, they kick up a haze that clings to everything and stays suspended for hours in low gravity. That means every breath inside a lunar habitat could carry invisible danger. Lab tests back up the worry. Simulated lunar dust kills up to 90% of exposed human lung cells and mouse neurons. That's not a typo. Nine out of 10 cells die after prolonged contact. The dust generates hydroxyl radicals, highly reactive molecules that break DNA apart at rates 10 times higher than quartz dust on Earth. NASA's own documentation admits they understand only the basics of the possible health effects. Apollo astronauts felt it firsthand. Harrison Schmidt described sneezing fits, red eyes, itchy throats, symptoms that lingered for days after leaving the surface. The dust wore through suit boots and gummed up seals. Inside the lunar module, it smelled like burnt gunpowder. 
David Goldsmith, a medical researcher, says treat moonwalkers as dusty trades workers in space. The risk is not just short-term irritation. Inhaling particles 50 times smaller than a human hair in an environment where they never settle means every future mission faces a hazard that is still not fully mapped. NASA's warnings are growing louder, but the gaps remain. The moon is shrinking. Not in theory, in fact. As its hot core cools, the crust contracts, squeezing the surface and snapping it along thrust faults. These are not ancient scars. Some are so fresh that boulders tumbled down them within the last few million years. Apollo seismometers picked up the tremors, shallow moonquakes, magnitude 5, strong enough to rattle a building. But on the moon, the shaking does not stop after a few minutes. The crust is bone dry, fractured and elastic. Seismic waves bounce back and forth, ringing the ground for up to an hour. Thomas Waters of the Smithsonian has mapped hundreds of these active faults, some running straight through the regions NASA is now eyeing for Artemis landings. His warning is blunt. The hazard probability goes way up depending on how close your infrastructure is to an active fault. It is not just the odds. It is the nature of the shaking. Prolonged, low-frequency motion that tests every bolt, every weld, every anchor point. Nicholas Schmer, a geophysicist at Maryland, puts it even more plainly. The risk of something catastrophic is not zero. The Starship Human Landing System stands 165 feet tall, a skyscraper on spindly legs, parked on regolith that could vibrate for an hour at a time. Engineers run the numbers, but the models are incomplete. Place a tall, top-heavy lander near an active fault, and the moon itself becomes the wild card. Not dust, not temperature, but ground that will not stay still. The margin for error shrinks with every meter closer to a scarp. The countdown to Artemis continues. Billions spent, hardware built, contracts signed. But the core questions remain unresolved. What is in the moon's deep interior? How lunar dust will shape human health? Whether the ground itself will hold? The science teams admit it in their own language. NASA's official risk assessments use phrases like unknowns, potential hazards, and further study needed. The dust mitigation systems, filters, airlocks, and electrostatic wipers are still untested in true lunar conditions. Engineers run simulations, but no one has lived through years of exposure or an hour-long moonquake in a real habitat. Insurance policies, legal waivers, and design margins fill the gap where certainty should be. The agency's own documentation concedes exposure limits for lunar dust are based on Apollo-era data, not long-term reality. Seismic hazard maps are updated, but the odds of a catastrophic event, however small, never reach zero. Yet the schedule holds. Landers are being assembled, crews are training. The decision is institutional, not personal. The risks are distributed, abstracted, and ultimately accepted. How much uncertainty is too much? When the unknowns outnumber the guarantees, does ambition outweigh caution? The moon is not changing. Our willingness to gamble with the unknown is the only variable left. Right now, NASA's own research admits we still do not fully understand the moon's chemistry, its seismic hazards, or the true risk lunar dust poses to human health. As Artemis prepares to land boots on this alien ground, the biggest danger may not be what we know. It may be what we have only just begun to question. The moon keeps its secrets. For now.